Welcome to the Primary Care Clerkship ECG Workshop Podcast. My name is Dr. Melissa Stiles from the Department of Family Medicine, and I would like to introduce Dr. Dean Keller, a general internist from UW West Clinic, who has been leading the ECG workshops for students for many years. Thanks for joining us, Dean. So before we get started, is there anything the students should be aware of, Dean? Uh, Yes, Melissa. There's two things, uh, and I believe they're on the first slide with the Bucky Badger on it. Uh, One is to introduce our website, and you can see the address on there. And this website is a great uh, reference for the podcast. Uh, There are some self-assessment quizzes and clinical cases on it. And the second issue is they should print off a copy of the guidelines and the directions uh, are on the slide and have this uh, in their hands as they watch the podcast and this will be uh, very helpful. I've had a chance to look at the guidelines. They look very complete. Is this essentially what they need to know? Yeah, the guidelines really is the entire course uh, on a single page. Well, let's talk about this podcast today. What are you going to emphasize? Uh, Two things. Um, One is after having taught this for many years, uh, we've got some very good student questions that come up, and I'll try to talk about some of those. And secondly is we'd like to tie in the clinical importance of ECG interpretations for the students as they provide care for patients uh, in the primary care clerkship setting, on their ward rotations, And many of the students actually come back to this their fourth year uh, as well. Well, let's launch into the first category, rate. Any thoughts on this topic? And by the way, do they need to follow the card in sequence? I think um, following the card in sequence will assure a complete reading. And this is a good way to start. Later, uh, they can perhaps develop their own methods, but sometimes it's easy to jump to an obvious problem and then uh, not have a complete reading and see some of the other things. So that's why we recommend starting out this way at least. And for rate, we have uh, three examples. The first example, uh, also called the common method, is one that probably will be used for 90 or 95 percent of the ECG readings. And I would definitely recommend memorizing the number sequence 300, 150, 100, 75, 60, and 50. Uh, This is particularly useful if you have to read a stack of 50 ECGs when you're on some of your rotation. The other two methods are used much less frequently and under certain circumstances. Perhaps looking at the examples would help. The common method slide shows three different tracings and by starting out finding an R wave on a heavy red line you simply count over the number of large boxes to get the rate. So 300, 150, 175 and then 60 so that would be your rate on the first example. The second uh, tachycardia example would be 300, 150 and the next one would be 300, 150, and 100. And again, just memorizing these numbers uh, will make it so much quicker. The second method generally will be used when you have a regular rhythm, but the bradycardia is such that you'll run out of numbers if you try using the common method. The example here, you can find an R wave uh, on a red line the first complex might be a good one, and then count over the number of large boxes. In this case, it happens to be seven and a half, a little bit of an unusual number, but you divide 300 by that number and it'll give you a rate of about 40. If there's 10 boxes between them, for instance, you'd 300 divided by 10 would give you a rate of 30, and this is where the numbers from the common method are calculated from. And finally, the third example is when you have an irregularly irregular rhythm and you need to take an average. This is an example of atrial fibrillation, which is probably one of the most common sustained outpatient arrhythmias that we see. So you will occasionally uh, be using this. I took the liberty of labeling the 30 boxes on the slide 
and remembering that a large box is 0.02 seconds, 30 multiplied by 0.02 will give you 6 seconds. That's why we pick that. It's a nice range to give you an average. And if you notice on the slide, what we're interested in is the number of R to R intervals, which is one R wave to the next R wave, not the number of R waves. So be sure you count the intervals, then you multiply that by 10 to get your 60 second reading. In this case, 8 intervals multiplied by 10 would give you a rate of 80. Oh, great. So we have a variety of methods, but you really emphasize the first one is probably the most useful and one we'd be using the most, I guess. It's one of those things like in anatomy. It's You just memorize it and uh, hopefully we'll use it for a good part of the rest of your career. I understand rhythm will be done separately, so let's move on to axis. So what is important about QRS axis and why don't you label it in degrees? I think for the purposes of our course, we really only care if the axis is normal to the right or to the left. Calculating in degrees takes extra steps. You have to find an isoelectric lead, find a perpendicular line to it, and I don't think it's really helpful at this point. Uh, if the axis is 40 degrees or 60 degrees, it's still in the normal quadrant, and that's mainly what I'm looking for. And the reason we do this is because there's a differential diagnosis for left axis and right axis deviation. It's listed in the guideline. And basically, there is some kind of an infarct, some kind of hypertrophy, or there would be a fascicular block. This is a diagnosis of exclusion, so think of fascicular block only if you don't see infarct or hypertrophy. So if there is a left or right axis deviation, this is really a tip-off that one of the above abnormalities exists. Uh, absolutely. That's why the QRS axis is very clinically useful, and the differential diagnosis uh, is probably also well worth uh, memorizing as you go through the next couple of years uh, of the student's clerkships. We'll take a look at some of the uh, axes, and first of all, we'll start out with a slide called normal axis. Uh, this might be a good time also just to discuss what a typical 12 lead looks like. On the left side you'll see leads 1, 2, 3, AVR, AVL, and AVF. These are also known as the limb leads. And on the right side V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, and V6 are called the precordial leads. Uh, if you haven't had the chance as a student to observe someone hooking up a 12 lead ECG, it would be very well worth your while because you'll see, for instance, that V1 and V2 are hooked up on the right side of the heart on the thorax and that V5 and V6 are on the left side. And finally, most 12 leads will have on the bottom a rhythm strip. This is oftentimes lead 2 and this is selected because it gives the best P wave morphology and QRS morphology. In the intensive care unit, they do sometimes use some modified leads, but on 12 leads, it's often lead uh, 2. So that's uh, our typical 12 lead and what it looks like. And then as far as axis, again, looking at the guidelines, it's fairly straightforward. We take a look at axis here, looking at leads 1 and AVF, and mainly the QRS axis is usually positive or negative, and some students ask, well, how do we know if it's close? In other words, if there's almost uh, an equal amount of it above and below the line. Usually what I recommend doing is taking a ruler and measuring the line between the T wave and the P wave that flat line is where I put my ruler and draw a line through. And then I count the small boxes above and the small boxes below on the QRS. And for instance, if it's four above and three below, that would still be a net positive uh, axis. So lead one is uh, upward and AVF is upward. So this is fairly straightforward. Uh, this would be a uh, normal uh, axis. Looking at the next slide, uh, which is left axis deviation, we'll take a look at lead 1, and here it's upright, and if we look at AVF, it's down, 
But uh, for left axis deviation, you have to look at one more lead. This is the only time you need to do that, and that's lead 2, which also must be negative. Uh, if it's positive in lead 2, this is often in the 0 to minus 30 range, which most cardiologists still uh, feel is uh, normal. And again, remembering when you see this that this is a tip-off, that there's something else wrong with the 12 lead. And another axis example is the right axis deviation. And if we look at lead 1, that's clearly down, and AVF is up. So this would be examples of right axis uh, deviation. And in addition to memorizing this, I would encourage the students also to look at the left axis differential and the right axis differential every time uh, that they run into an abnormal uh, axis. The next section is on hypertrophic criteria for the four chambers of the heart. Dean, this looks pretty busy. Any helpful hints on these criteria? Uh, it is busy. And uh, although it will require using the guidelines, uh, often the students will carry it in their pocket for the third and maybe even some of the fourth year, uh, it does finally become fairly easy to follow and, and can be done fairly quickly. One hint is whenever you're given a choice, such as an S wave in V1 or V2, or an R wave in V5 or V6, always pick the largest wave. Also notice the very small word OR when it says you can pick lead V1 or V2, make sure you don't uh, pick them both and add them together. And also atrial hypertrophy, which is also very busy. I remember one of the students in a session saying that the right and left atrium, that right reaches, and that means uh, a P wave that's three boxes tall. And she also mentioned that it helped her to remember by saying left is long, and that's three boxes long or three boxes wide. And let's uh, take a look at some examples, and perhaps this will become a little bit clearer. The next slide is titled Left uh, Ventricular Hypertrophy. And uh, if you take a look uh, at the criteria, uh, again, picking the largest um, S wave in V1 or V2, I would pick V2 and the largest R wave in V5 or V6, I would pick V5. You can add those two together and clearly they're greater than 35. In addition, uh, this might be a good time to point out something called the strain pattern of hypertrophy. And the strain pattern means that the T wave is asymmetrically inverted. It's not quite perfectly inverted. It's a little bit more downward and then it will quickly slope up. Later we'll talk about ischemia which also causes T wave inversion and how do you tell the difference? Well before I would label it, it as a strain pattern of course you first have to have hypertrophy so make sure that you have hypertrophy and then make sure that the strain pattern is in the proper leads. So in this example, left ventricular hypertrophy, you see the T wave inversions in leads V5 and V6. And again, looking at the EKG tech as they hook the patient up, leads V5 and V6 are on the left side of the heart. So this would be left ventricular hypertrophy. And you'll also notice that it does pull the uh, axis leftward. Atrial hypertrophy is uh, somewhat uh, harder to look at, but basically for left atrial hypertrophy we look in lead 2, which may be somewhat difficult, but it is three small boxes long. And also if you look in lead V1, which is the second criteria, uh, the P wave is mainly negative. The terminology, uh, an increase in the terminal negative deflection is always rather interesting. Nobody knows what it means, including me. But I think what the authors mean there, and you'll see this in several books, is that the T wave is mainly uh, negative. And it makes sense. If you have left ventricular hypertrophy, you're probably going to have left atrial hypertrophy. And a good example of this patient may be someone who has uh, long-standing uh, hypertension, uh, for instance. 
And again, if we look at the next one, which is right ventricular hypertrophy, uh, here, if you look at V1, you'll see that the R wave is taller than the S wave, and that should really never happen in a normal tracing. And as you go from V1 to V6, your R wave actually gets smaller, which is the exact opposite of what it should be in the normal adults. So this certainly looks like it could be uh, right ventricular hypertrophy. And uh, in addition, right atrial hypertrophy, again, uh, in lead two, the right reaches. Uh, it's somewhat difficult to see exactly how many boxes high the P wave is, but I think everyone would agree that the P waves are abnormally large when you look at the corresponding QRSs. Uh, they look uh, almost as large or larger. And then the second criteria is mainly that the P wave is positive uh, in lead V1, and again, this initial positive deflection uh, terminology. Oh, great. Very helpful. The last section in this podcast will be on infarct. Do the ischemia, injury, and infarct patterns represent a time frame? And why do the students need to bother knowing the leads and what area of the heart they represent is listed in the guidelines? Uh, very good questions and uh, absolutely right about the timeline. Uh, if a plaque, for instance, suddenly occluded a coronary artery, the myocardial cells would first show the deep symmetrical T wave inversion of ischemia from the relative decrease in blood flow. Then if the occlusion continues, the cells would next experience actual injury and begin to show the injury pattern of ST elevation. And finally, the cells would die and you would see the Q waves of infarct. Uh, this is why it's so important to do fibrinolytic therapy or angioplasty as soon as possible in the setting of acute coronary uh, insufficiency. As far as knowing the leads and what area of the heart they represent, this is very important for prognosis. Any acute damage to the left ventricle can trigger serious arrhythmias uh, and certainly can cause uh, sudden death. However, uh, patients who get through the first 24 or 48 hours, the prognosis often depends on the location of the infarct. As an example, the anterior wall is much more serious. It usually will decrease your ejection fraction and cardiac reserve and also it supplies important areas of the conduction pathway and can lead to more serious heart blocks, uh, such as a Mobitz II or a third degree. Inferior wall myocardial infarcts usually affect the ejection fraction much less and cause less serious blocks, such as first degree or Winky Bach. These patients are often asymptomatic, and when you see these patients in the clinic, oftentimes the anterior wall patient will have several steps of uh, easy dyspnea, and sometimes it might have a pacemaker. The inferior wall MI patient may be completely asymptomatic, and you would never know it uh, if they hadn't mentioned it to you or you had seen an EKG. So at this point, it might be useful to take a look at some of the uh, examples again on the slides. And the first one we'll look at is labeled ischemia. And here, I think you can see, especially in leads V2, V3, V4, and V5, that the T waves are deeply and symmetrically inverted. They're also noticed in uh, several leads in the anterior wall. So you wouldn't call these a strain pattern. First of all, there's no hypertrophy. Second, these are uh, symmetrically inverted, and they're in... Uh, several areas uh, of the heart, and this is very early on in the course of uh, an ischemic event. You would like to get this patient in the ER uh, quickly before you see uh, any uh, further um, time get passed. Uh, the second example is uh, an injury pattern, and that's the ST elevation, and in this one we can see it in V3, V4, and V5, a little bit in V6. And you'll notice that the QRS pattern never really comes back down. It's, uh, the ST segment is elevated off of the uh, baseline. And that point where it is elevated, you'll sometimes hear referred to uh, as the J point. But this is an acute injury uh, pattern. This patient 
is now further into the course of their myocardial infarct. And um, although this is still a patient you could intervene on, you would like to catch them a little bit earlier if you can. And finally, the last example labeled infarct shows uh, Q waves. And this is the patient where the myocardium has actually died. And Q waves can be seen in V2, V3, V4. And uh, we often get the question of what is a Q wave? And uh, definition of a Q wave is when you follow the QRS complex, the very first deflection, if it's down, it's a Q wave. Even if there's a small spike that suggests an R wave, uh, then that would help you differentiate. But clearly there's no spike up initially. They're down. This is often called by residents um, queuing out or the patient is now having um, Q waves present, which may mean an old infarct. And of course, uh, you can have these processes occurring together. For instance, you might have some ST elevation and in addition already start to get some Q waves of the uh, dead uh, myocardial area. Thank you very much, Dean. You're so uh, just to review, please review back to the website and to print out the guidelines. Thank you all for joining us for this primary care podcast. There is a second podcast on ECG rhythms and the clinical issues surrounding them. Hope to see you there.